Okay, so now let's look at the bottom area of Spark. This is the bottom area. And the default view is this, the studio view, where you edit all your instruments, but also in the bottom area we have the mixer and the library. Okay. So let's begin with the studio view, where you edit all your instruments. And once you're in the studio view, this 1 to 8 and 9 to 16 button come into play here. You can jump between looking at instruments 1 to 8, 1 to 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And the second bank, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. There's also this all view that cycles between a graphic and all 16 instruments. I don't find it that useful, but there it is. So basically you choose 1 to 8 or 9 to 16 like that, and then any instrument, you click on its plus icon, its edit window opens in the middle. So if I select instrument number 7 here, by clicking its plus icon, its edit window appears in the middle here, and it also becomes the selected instrument here on the GUI, and uh, also on the hardware, and that works the other way around. If I select instrument number two on the GUI or the hardware, then back in the studio area, it is pre-selected and its edit window is in the middle. Okay, You can click on the icon of any instrument to hear it, And that's how this all works. So let's check it all out. Um, okay, I'm just going to load up a different project. Here we go. Now, Spark has three different types of instruments physical model instruments, um, sample instruments and analog model instruments and they all have the exact same edit window apart from of course uh, sampled instruments have the sample window in the middle of the edit area physical and analog model instruments don't so they just replace the sample window with a graphic okay now all the edit windows are the same for all three types of instruments so let's check out what edit parameters we've got Along the bottom we've got the six raw edit parameters of the instrument. There's always six and they subtly change pretty much with every instrument that you edit. Okay, so these change according to the instrument, but there's always six. Then living over the six edit parameters is the master filter for the instrument, which lives up here on the right. It can be low pass, band pass or high pass, and it's got a cutoff and resonance control. And then on the left there is a quick access volume and pan a mute and a solo, our choke group list, like that. Then the graphic is in the middle, which you can click on to trigger the instrument. And above that there is a drop down list here, the classification or category of the instrument and the title. And whatever category the instrument is in, that will be the selected category showing here. Okay. Now. There's really not much to say about the edit uh, parameters. They're all the same for all types of instrument, apart from the sample window, as I said. So leaving aside the sample window, which we'll save for the end, basically you've got the six edit parameters. You just tweak on those and hear what you do, and, and when you like it, stop. And then you tweak the filter, set it to what type of filter you want, tweak the filter. You can adjust the volume and pan quickly from here, etc. And that's the edit parameters you know they're always the same so they don't really need explaining much except to say that we have this same facility down here with the six edit parameters and the filter where you control and left click on any of the part and we can disable its motion in the sequencer if there's any controller writ data written in for that parameter we just control left click on the pot and we can disable or enable the motion from these parts by choosing enable motion, enable motion if it's disabled, and disable motion if it's enabled. And we can also choose any parameter from here, and, and like we want to adjust the pitch for this instrument, we hold down control, left click, choose edit motion, it jumps us to the sequencer, to the track for that instrument with that parameter pre-selected from the, from the controller list, ready to put in that particular controller. Okay. And it's the same for the filter. Control, left click. You can disable the motion of any of the filter parameters or jump straight to edit that parameter for the track. 
same with the pan, same with the volume. Okay. So apart from those uh, edit parameters, as I say, only the edit window for the sample bit changes. We'll look at that last. So what other facilities has an edit window got? Well, it's got the choke group, and it's got the category list and the title here. And that's it. So let's look at these two, and then we'll go and look at the sample window last. So we'll start with this category and title here. What's all that about? Well, let's choose this instrument here. Let's load up a bass drum. It's the default project bass drum, 80 Studio Drums bass drum. There it is. Now I think to myself, I want to edit this sound. Shall I start mangling the filter? Like that. Then I'll mangle some of the edit parameters down here. Like that. And I think, oh yeah. Quite like that. Yes, I quite like that. Let me change the pitch as well. Yes. Yeah, I quite like that. It's like a sort of um it's like a sort of log drum or something, right? Um hmm. I'll put a f I'll put some effects on it as well. So any instrument that's selected in the edit window here, you just go to the mixer, its channel is pre-selected. Any instrument's channel can have up to two insert effects, so I'll just click on any insert effect slot for this channel for the instrument. The effects panel slides up. I'll choose a compressor. I'll quickly choose a preset and tweak it. Then I'll choose also a flanger. Quickly choose a preset, tweak it. There we are. There's the uh, there's the sound I've created, including insert effects. I quite like it. it sounds like a log drum, so I think I, I like that sound. I want to save that and then I'll be able to use it in other projects, or I just simply want to save it as part of this project. So, well, it doesn't sound like a bass drum to me anymore. So I'll change the category first, drop the list down, and decide what category the instrument should go into now. And I think it's now a percussion instrument. When you change the category, the icon changes, etc. So I'll put it into percussion. And now I just double click the title. I'm going to call it Log Drum. Log Drum, there you go. Enter, done. So I've retitled and recategorized my edit. And now that recategorization and the retitling will be saved when I save the project. So I go save, save the project. Um, if it was a factory project, I'd have to choose Save As, because you can't overwrite factory projects, but this is a user project, so I simply choose Save. And um, Spark asked me, do I want to copy, uh, save a copy of the audio samples with the project? Well, I'm using only factory samples, so I don't need to back them up. You only need to back up the samples if you've brought samples into your project from other disk or network locations, and then Spark will back them up in the Spark library with the project, so I'm only using factory samples, so no need to do that, so I say no, and I've saved the project. And when I save the project, it saves this edit into the category I've chosen with the title I've chosen for it. So now I can load a completely different project, choose any of the instruments, and then simply click on the title slot of that instrument. See the title here where it says Funk Drums MT, the current instrument. Click on that. Choose the category, which was percussion. It was a sample instrument. Go in my list here. and There's my log drum look. Log drum. Select it. It's loaded. And there's my sound. It's loaded all the edits I did, the cutoff edit I did, and it's even loaded the effects onto the channel. And these are the effects I put on my edit exactly how I set them. The only thing is sometimes when you load an instrument into a channel that channel previously had some auxiliary send information on it. That doesn't get updated so you might have to take any auxiliaries off but there is the sound. So that's what the category list and the title is for. Okay, next thing to look at is the choke groups. Now, experienced users know what choke groups are. We get eight of them in Spark, but for beginners I'll explain that now. Choke groups. 
Okay, it's a hi hat. Closed hi hat. And here's an open hi hat. Okay, I've closed an open hi hat. Now look at the open hi-hat graphic here and see the top symbol of the pair of hi-hat symbols. It's got a little clamp at the top with a with a, a key you can turn to tighten it onto the metal shaft that goes up the middle of the hi-hat stand, right? Well that little mechanism holding the top symbol, that is the hi-hat choke. And the idea is, is when you take your foot off the pedal, the centre rod of the hi-hat rises up and you adjust the choke so you can adjust how far apart the symbols are when the hi-hat is opened. In other words, you're adjusting the choke of the hi-hat. Now, an open hi-hat is always closed when the pedal is pressed down to make it a closed hi-hat. Closed. Open. Closed. The two cannot play together. So choke groups were invented on early drum machines to imitate the fact that a closed hi-hat when it plays always shuts down an open hat. And that's why choke groups were invented. Okay. Now we have eight possible choke groups in Spark. So our two hi-hats are in choke group number two. That means that in the simplest sense a choke group means that the two instruments or more instruments in any choke group can't all play together. Only one of them can play at a time. So in the case of our hi-hats, they can't both play, of course. Okay, so we use the choke like this. I'll show you. Here's our open hi-hat. It's selected. We jump to the sequencer. There's its track selected. Open up the track. Solo it. There is our open hat. Okay, now I'm going to put an open hat on the first beat. Every quarter beat of the bar. There it is, and it's going to go tss, 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 like that. Oh. Just turn the tempo down a bit. Now, the hi hat, the open hi hat goes tss and sustains all the way until it's re triggered. Re triggered, re triggered, re triggered, re triggered like that. Now let's bring in the closed hat above, which is in the same choke group, remember, they cannot both play at the same time. So if I, if I put a closed hi-hat there, 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 and there, then whenever these closed hi-hats play, they will shut down the open hat from playing. So this is like where we stood on the pedal, because we hear the closed hat plays, which is the pedal shut, so the open hat gets shut, so it goes tss, shut down. Tss, shut down, tss, shut, tss, shut, like this. Okay, and if we lower the velocity of the closed hat so we can no longer hear the stick hitting it, then this simply becomes like where the pedal is pressed shut. So, tss, shut the pedal, tss, shut the pedal, tss, shut the pedal, tss, shut the pedal down, right, like this. but make the velocity of the closed hats louder and then we hear them being hit with the stick as well as being closed down. So tss, close and hit, tss, close and hit, tss, close and hit, etc. Like this. Yeah, so that's what a closed and open hat do and that's how we imitate the choke. The choke group imitates the closed hat shutting down the open hat. That's kind of what choke groups were invented for. But um, but beginners, we don't have to only use choke groups on hi-hats. Oh no, we can be creative, you know. So let's do something creative with a choke, uh, just to show beginners. Look, I've got a couple of synths. I've got a long, sustaining, booming synth. And I've got a short, little stabby synth. Just take the echo off that. Okay, so two synths and they are both in choke group 8. Choke group 8. Now, they're in the same choke, gr choke group together, meaning they can't both play at the same time. But notice we don't put them in the same choke group as the hi-hats, choke group 2, 
because if all these instruments were in the same choke group, when the hi-hats played, they'd interfere with the synths. And when the synths played, they'd interfere with the hi-hats. And that's why it's good that we've got so many choke groups, so we can have different choke groups for different instruments. Okay. But both our synths are in choke group 8, meaning only one of them can play at a time. And we can exploit that choke group with a couple of synths to make interesting patterns. So here's our big sustaining synth. It's selected. Go to the sequencer. There's its track pre-selected, ready to go. Open it up, solo it. So we've got the big booming synth there, going round and round like that. Here we go. Let's hear it. Now we bring in our second synth, which is in the same choke group. They cannot both play at the same time. So if I put in a stabby synth there, there and there. Then every time the stabby synth plays, let's have some velocity so we can see the notes here. Every time the stabby synth plays, these are in the same choke group so they can't both play at the same time, one cuts the other out. So the stabby synth playing here, here and here will cut out the long sustaining synth, just like the closed hi-hat cut the open hi-hat out. So this long sustaining synth will now be cut out by this stabby synth underneath in the same choke group. So it'll go cut out, cut out, cut out. And we get this effect. Put them both into solo so we can hear them both. Here we go. You see that is being cut down by the synth. As soon as the synth sounds, it cuts the sustaining one out. And it makes an interesting pattern between them. And then all I have to do is fiddle around with where the stabby notes cut the, the long synth out. <coughs> yeah, there's an interesting pattern. The two synths work empathically together, one cutting the other one out, and together they form a pattern, which is quite cool I think and um, and all we've got to do is like you know whack in a kick drum let me just put a kick back on here there we go kick drum so that bring that into the mix as well go back to the top let's hear it with a kick drum in as well quite a cool effect yeah you know so always experiment beginners you can get some interesting patterns and things happening when you start using choke groups between different drums or instruments okay there you go that's choke groups for you and uh, now you should know what they do right so that just leaves one thing doesn't it <coughs> and that is the sample window Right, I set up a different project. The sample window. Here is an empty sample instrument. We have six sample layers. Okay, so I'll first show you how to quickly um, populate a sample instrument. You choose layer one. Always start with layer one, and you can click here to add a sample, which opens up this dialog thing. <clears throat> you know, like to browse your hard drives or what have you, but uh, it's way, 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 way easier to simply get your hard drive view next to your Spark and simply drag a sample and drop it. Bang. Done. There we go. Well, that's not a very inspiring sample. Don't like it? Click the red X button here to unload it. Boom. Unloaded. Let's put in another one. Don't like that. Unload it. Let's put in this rim shot from an SCI drum tracks. Here we go. Nice rim shot sound. Like that. It's that easy to load a sample. Just drag and drop. And they could be WAV or AIF. Okay, now once a sample is in the window, all you can do is adjust the end time, the start time. Reverse it. 
and adjust its velocity, you know, its gain for the sample. That's all you can do. Very basic. Okay. Now let's say you want to bring in another layer. Select the next layer, bring in another sound, drop it. Now we've got two layers now. And once we've got more than one layer, our layer list here comes into play. This decides how the layers are played. Now let's stick it into stack. Stack is where you want any layers that are in there to play all back at the same time, like making a layered bass drum or something. So we are now in stack and our two layers will both trigger. And then we adjust the level between them using their gains. Let's bring another layer in, layer 3, let's find a nice booming 808 kick or something. Here we go, let's try this one, drag and drop. Now we've got a third layer, turn up its gain a bit, here we go. So there's a three layer drum sound. Okay, and as I say, all you can do is with each layer is adjust its end and start time and its gain or reverse it, that's it. Um, otherwise the only other thing is every individual layer can have its own gain level. Or if you click this link here then the gain of all of them is linked. Like this. Turn them all down. Turn them all up. Unlink. Go back to having individual gains. There's layer 1. Turn it right down. Layer 2. Turn it right down. Layer 3. Now we're only hearing layer 3. Layer 2, fade some of that in. Layer 1, fade some of that in. Etc. But there's no way to audition samples from here. Okay. So that's it. That's how easy it is to import a sample and to build a layered sound. Okay. And if we're doing layered sounds, we use stack to make them all play at once. Okay. And that's really it. So let's just look at these different layer playback options now. And to do that I've got a, a drum here called Threshold Drum. Now this has got six completely different layers. So they're very easy to tell apart. Now let's look at the different layer triggering options. Okay. We've got Stack. Let me just go up to the sequencer here. Put it into the last step of two. Solo it, open it up. Now we've got a last step of two, which means this note here just gets triggered over and over and over again because our last step is here too. So the sequence is going to go boom, 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 just round around like that, just triggering this one note. Here we go. Turn the tempo down a bit. So, down at the bottom again, let's look at the different ways that our layers can be played back. Stack. They're all played back at once. As I said, then all you can do is adjust the individual levels. Layer 1, go to layer 2, adjust its level. Layer 3, adjust its level. 4, adjust its level, etc. etc. Stack, they all play back at once. Random, they play back in random order. Circular, they play one after the other in a circle, round and round and round. One, two, as many layers as you've got. I've got six, so it should go one, two, three, four, five, six, back again. One, two, it just plays round and round the layers in a circle. But, <laughs> for some reason, and I'm so disappointed with this, Circular doesn't work on my Mac. It just doesn't work. Look, I put it in Circular, and, and these layers should play back one after the other in order. But all I ever get is layer one being triggered. <laughs> And I talked to the head guy, you know, does the tech at support at, at R2, and he went, well, we don't know why he's doing this. Yeah, he, you know, and I believe him because I, I spent a day looking on Google. I could not find anyone with the same problem. But that's what circular should do. It should just cycle through the layers one by one. Uh, to be honest, I'm not that bothered it doesn't work. I might find it useful, but there you go. Okay, that leaves two other ways that our layers can be triggered threshold and velocity okay now they're a bit badly named in my opinion because threshold is velocity switching <laughs> it's straight velocity switching 
I suppose they call it threshold because the the layer that gets triggered by the note depends on the threshold of its velocity. So working up from the bottom, the lowest velocity triggers the first layer and the highest velocity triggers the last layer. So we've got six layers, we're in threshold, and as I bring the note up in velocity it will trigger the six layers one after the other. Here we go. Layer one, two, three, Four, five, six, and it's simple velocity switching. And whichever layer is triggered, it always plays back at full volume set by the gain control for that layer. That's threshold. And that just leaves velocity. Now, velocity is a variation on threshold. Really, they should have called threshold velocity because it's straight velocity switching, and velocity they should have called crossfade. <laughs> okay, but anyway, threshold simply the velocity of the note. It's straight velocity switching. The threshold of the note decides which layer is going to be triggered, and it's always triggered at full volume set by the gain for the layer. Velocity is crossfading velocity. Okay. Here is our velocity snare. Let's choose that. Let's put it into velocity. Now we've got a snare here, six layers, and each layer is the, is a sample of the snare being hit louder and louder. So layer one, the first layer, is, is a sample of the snare being hit very gently, and the last layer is a sample of the snare being hit really hard. And with it set to velocity, simply as the notes increase in velocity, it cross fades up from the softest sample to the loudest sample and gradually increases the volume that the note is being played back at, you know, the sound is being played back at. So the velocity not only gradually increases the volume of the instrument being played, but gradually cross fades up from the first layer to the last layer through the samples. Okay, so here let's put it into the last step of 12. Okay, so these notes will crossfade up through the samples from the softest sample on layer 1 up to the loudest sample on layer 6 and gradually it will increase the velocity of the instrument being played at the same time. Like this, here we go. But hang on a minute, we don't want that other one playing. Get out of it, gotcha. Right, here we go. Yeah, so it's just playing back the instrument louder and louder and louder as the velocity gets louder and it cross fades up from the softest sample up to the loudest sample. So you use velocity when you want to do very, you know, accurate multi layer drums that go from the softest hit to the loudest hit. And that's your layering. Simple. Uh, okay, look, there's one last thing that I want to show for beginners, we might as well, about the sample edit area, the sample window, sample instruments. Um, for beginners, how do you make a drum loop play back perfectly from Spark? Uh, a lot of beginners probably want to know this. Um, well, the thing about Spark is it's designed to copy an old school instrument, and that's what's so brilliant about it. It's fast, it's furious, it's proper old school. Um, but as a consequence of that, we don't have time stretch. So how did we used to do it in the old days? You know, back when we used S700s and S900s and Emacs and things like that, there were no time stretch in those days. How do we make our loop cycle around and fit our song? Well, I'm going to show that for beginners. Uh, here's an empty sample instrument, and if you've got an empty sample in instrument and you're going to load it up, always make sure you select the first layer, layer 1. Then we just drag and drop our loop. It could be WAV or AIF. There we go. And we set the start time, which is roughly there, and then the end time about a bar in length. So we want about a four beat bar of the loop playing. Let's hear that. There you go, near enough. And then all we do is we go to the sequencer here, we put a note in triggering that loop. Here it goes. And then all we can do to make it fit is the first thing we can do is we can adjust the tempo until it loops around perfectly like this. I'll adjust the tempo using 
the tempo control on the hardware controller but you can see it changing on this display here right so I'll change the tempo now until it fits There you go, 138 beats per minute, the loop fits, it cycles around perfectly. But you might say to yourself, but uh, what, if I, what if my song can't be increased in tempo that much? What if that makes the song then completely wrong? What if my tempo needs to be more round around 124, 25, 26? Okay, set the tempo to 124, or whatever, somewhere around there. Now what can we do? We can't speed the tempo up, well the only thing we can do is lower the pitch of the sample. Now as we lower the pitch it plays back slower and slower which means it takes longer to play. So we'll drop it down by a semitone. Now it'll play back slower and it'll start to fit our slower tempo. Here we go. Okay a little bit more. Let's bring it down another semitone in tempo. Let's hear it now. There you go, now it fits and now as a last tweak we just tweak the tempo subtly to make it fit a little bit better and we can try tweaking the start time to make it sound a bit better, you know. So I'll tweak the tempo now. Bring that start time in a bit. Come on, like that. Let's try that. Now trim too much off. Let's try that. Okay, now it fits at about 123, so you do it like that. You tweak between the tempo and the pitch, tempo and pitch, and you arrive at a compromise where the loop fits. That's how we used to do it in the old days. Now, if you are bringing a loop into Spark to work with a song, and it's, the loop, it's a loop you didn't prepare specifically to fit the song, and your tempo cannot be changed, and the loop has to fit, well, all you can do is you've got to open that loop in, a, an, in another editor like WaveLab or something, time stretch it in another software to the correct speed then import it and it'll play back at the right tempo otherwise you know real audio parts that you play or sing like vocal parts bass lines guitar parts that you want to bring into spark obviously you're going to play those along to the song you're working on so they'll be the right tempo you know but, but anything that wasn't created to go with the song you and if you cannot change the tempo at all then you just got to time stretch it using a third party software. There you go. Who knows if Arturo will add time stretch to their window? I doubt it. But um, they are going to add a zoom feature for this apparently soon, and they are going to add the, an ability to trigger the individual layers from here. But there you go. That is your, um, that's your studio area.